Okay, so to sum up our discussion, let us briefly compare uh, the main positions of Hobbes and Locke. <clears throat> so, as you will remember from last time, Hobbes, like his main conclusion, is that tyranny can be as bad as anarchy, but tyranny can never be worse than anarchy. Mm -hmm. That the social order is deeply artificial, that by nature, human beings are in a state of war, that in absence, of mechanisms that will force people to, ob to behave in pro-social ways, in the absence of those mechanisms, like randomly somewhere in the middle of the jungle, you cannot automatically trust other people. Locke's conclusion is very different, right? So Locke has this very complicated and, as I mentioned, problematic balancing act, that he's trying to say that by nature human beings are good, and therefore, you know, we're always entitled to go back to the state of nature, state of nature is better than tyranny, but at the same time, he also wants to say that, you know, we should make societies, we should delegate our power to society. So, the, the state of nature is better than tyranny, but not as good as the social contract. So, when we talk about the state of nature in general, for Hobbes, we're talking about unimaginable horrors, the worst horrors, right? Uh, whereas for Locke, we're only talking about inconveniences, inconveniences. And again, the big problem with Locke's account is how do we account for all the history of violence and genocide and exploitation and of slavery and of witch hunts, hunts you know, if, if Locke's assumptions are correct, right? And if, we, if people are really so good, why do all these horrible things happen? And if people are really so good, why do we need society at all, right? This is a problematic uh, uh, um, issue in Locke. Some of my students have asked me this question, you know, if Locke is right, why do genocides happen? Um, also, when we talk about the state of nature, for Hobbes, this is mostly a hypothetical condition, this is mostly a thought experiment. Yeah, sometimes, you know, during the breakdown of civil authority, in times of civil war crisis, during the Thirty Years' War in the No Man's Land, you can see something approximating the state of nature, but it's mostly a hypothetical condition for Hobbes. And definitely, Hobbes does not say that sometime in the ancient past, all the world was in the state of nature. Hobbes does not say that. For Locke, it's important that the state of nature is very real, and indeed, in the history of the world, in order for his social contract to work and to be legitimate, the whole world needs to have been in this uh, uh, fairly harmonious state of nature. And mm -mm, to flesh this out some more, right? so human beings by nature, again, talking about the state of nature in a certain sense is a way of talking about human nature. Human, humans by nature are asocial. I don't want to say that human beings are bad for Hobbes. Human beings are not bad. The world is bad. And we do whatever we can to survive. But it means that there's no natural cooperation for Hobbes. Right? So human beings are asocial. And we act pro-socially only if there are mechanisms. Right? And the reason, our reason, our rationality that is guiding us, is an amoral calculator. Whatever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is that which he calls good. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, because reason will not tell us what is right and what is wrong, it is only the passions that tell us what is right and what is wrong, and passions are different and pull in different directions, that is why humans are asocial for Hobbes. For Locke, not so. For Locke, not so. Reason tells us that there's a God, reason tells us that there's God's law, and therefore there's objective morality, basically protecting God's property. We, we ought to protect ourselves and protect others as much as we can. And therefore, human beings by nature are deeply pro-social for Locke. Continuing on uh, um, from the assumptions about human nature and the state of nature, right? Uh, the basis of morality and of politics for Hobbes is that, again, by nature, nothing is right or wrong. This is the strength of Hobbes' view. Again, this mechanistic uh, um, post, you know, after the scientific revolution, in the wake of the scientific revolution, nothing by nature is good or bad. Let's try to derive morality from these amoral assumptions. There are rights, everybody, every living thing does whatever it can to survive, and there's no difference between men, women, between blacks, whites, between, you know, between different animals or animals and people, there's no, there's no difference. Fundamentally, the right of every living thing is to do whatever it can to preserve itself. And rights, in this sense for Hobbes, are more important than duties, if you want proto nietzschean element in Hobbes. And again, this fundamental right is the right to all things. 
For Locke, not so. In an important sense, duties are before rights. We have unconditional duties, unconditional duties to God. We, we, are, we are owned by God. We are God's property. And so we must preserve ourselves and preserve, preserve others as much as possible. Again, a problematic theological assumption. Again, again Hobbes assumes nothing. Uh, Locke has this uh, uh, um, theological assumption which does a lot of work. And again, so deep question. Um, so much of contemporary liberal theory relies on the notion of natural rights and relies directly or indirectly on Locke's uh, uh, philosophy. Can Locke work without God? Far fewer people believe in God today. Again, like the, the Charter of United Nations is not based on universal consensus on theological matters. So, like contemporary societies in the 21st century are not based on wide agreement of, of, on religious dogma or on some kind of, you know, theological premises. So, basically, the way that Locke relied on the existence of God, we cannot, even if we ourselves believe in God, we cannot rely politically uh, on the belief in God. So the question is, can Locke work without God? Can the idea of natural rights work without God? It's a big question. The answer is not clear. So continuing on from this, so when human beings make the social contract, the social contract for Hobbes is the alienation contract. We give up, we alienate all of our rights. Uh, uh, to the sovereign who is absolute. And the absolute sovereign actually obeys the right of nature. The right of nature is the right to all things. So by the right of nature, the sovereign cannot be bound to do anything. The sovereign can do whatever the sovereign decides to do. So we give up. This is the social contract. And Hobbes insists that nothing short of absolute authority will suffice for peace. Nothing short of absolute authority will suffice for peace. Now, the king or the government or the sovereign, the democratic sovereign, for example, does not need to be tyrannical for Hobbes, does not need to be tyrannical. The sovereign can provide rights to the individuals. But it's important that at the end of the day, the, there is a, resolu the, a mechanism of resolution of any dispute. The final authority in any dispute is the sovereign. For, and again, nothing short of absolute authority will suffice for peace for Hobbes. For Locke, not so, not so. I do not own myself. Therefore, I cannot give up absolute rights over myself to anybody because I do not have absolute rights over myself. So therefore, I can only delegate. Again, what do I delegate? I delegate the executive power of the law of nature, which is not really a right, but more of a duty, duty to preserve myself and others. And therefore, my actions are limited by the law of nature. And the actions of my government are limited by the law of nature, always necessarily limited by the law of nature. If disputes arise, it's not clear how they're going to be resolved. They're going to be resolved through violence. Is this not going to lead to war of all against all? It's not clear. Again, you see, Locke cannot just say that disputes will never arise because they do arise, because they do arise. So this is, again, a point of Locke's philosophy, but a problematic point. The government is limited, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, the government is limited by the law of nature. But practically, if the government wants to call on the notion of the prerogative power, even though government, the actions of the government are theoretically limited, in practice, in practice, by calling on, by appealing to the prerogative power, in practice, the government might act in an absolute fashion, in an absolute, absolutist fashion, claiming again to act outside the letter of the law or even against the spirit of the letter of the law, outside or against the letter of the law to preserve the spirit of the law, claiming. Problematic issue, problematic issue. So continuing on from this, if we talk about consent, again, is Hobbes really a contract thinker? Well, yes and no, maybe not exactly. Hobbes says, if you are being protected, you must obey. The point of the Leviathan is that there's a mutual relation between protection and obedience. If you are protected, you must obey because this is in your interest. Not because you have a duty to God or something like that, but because, again, it's in your interest, otherwise you die. Why did slaves in Egypt or in Rome obey? Because they were afraid to die. Locke insists that all legitimate government has to be based on consent. But this consent is very obviously not explicit, so it must be tacit consent. What is tacit consent? Inheriting property, staying in the land. Jo uh, uh, um, um, David Hume, later, will criticize this notion of tacit consent in Locke. Hume is going to say, 
Imagine you're a poor person. You're born in a country with no knowledge of a foreign language, with no means to buy yourself a ticket. Can you really move out of the country? Can you really afford to move out? David Hume says, imagine you have been secretly stolen away on a ship and you find yourselves in the middle of the ocean. Do you consent uh, to be ruled by the captain of the ship? What's your alternative? Jump overboard? Again, this issue, like theoretically, everything in Locke is by consent and theoretically consent can be withdrawn, but in reality, many people cannot afford to withdraw their consent. So again, is this true basis of a government by consent, or is this just ideology that masks oppression in Locke? There is also oppression in Hobbes, right? But Hobbes does not mask oppression. He says, all government is based on force. Might makes right. It's unpalatable, but it's the truth, right? But Locke wants to provide this consensual basis, but is it really there? And is it effective? So at the end of the day, again, because nobody can be the judge between you and the sovereign, for, for Hobbes, we have to consent to absolute authority, so there is and can be no right of revolution. Individuals absolutely give up their right to judge the sovereign. However, it's a very important liberal, liberal and democratic element in Hobbes. Of course, if the government is trying to kill you, or if the sovereign is trying to kill you, or if the, so again, this phrase in Hobbes, life so as not to be wary of it. Uh -huh. So, if your life becomes unpalatable, then the contract is broken, the contract becomes void. And even though there's theoretically no right of revolution, effectively, in reality, there's, there very much is a right of revolution. Not to mention, again, when we talk about uh, mechanisms, um, even though people have no right to re revolt, they will revolt, perhaps. And the, the sovereign is afraid of other sovereigns, and the sovereign is afraid of revolutions, and this will make sure that the sovereign behaves. Now, this is not 100% guarantee, but Hobbes says this is the best that the, that the universe offers us. It's not a bulletproof guarantee, but it's the best guarantee that you can have, that the government will take care of you. And Locke says, no, you have a right of revolution. In fact, I say right, it's more of a duty of revolution. Because in a justified revolution, people are punishing the government who are rebels against God. Right? But the question is, again, if people are too ready, too willing to exercise this right of revolution, then, you know, society plunges into chaos and Locke steps back and says, no, 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 no. People are patient. They will wait patiently until re revolting, right? Until the abuses have, uh, have become really egregious. And then the question is, what is the difference then between Hobbes and Locke? So Locke promises this right of revolution, but is it really, uh, is it really effective in, in reality, right? And um, at the end of the day, again, it seems that Locke relies on this very robust notion of reason and consent and consensus. And I think the biggest problem with this side of the board, with, the, with Locke, is if human beings really were as rational and as consensual as, Hobbes, as Locke portrays them, there would never be a need for any government. There would, ne there would never be any abuses. There would never be a need for revolution at the end of the day. So you see, it's kind of a problematic and interesting situation, right? Uh, uh, Hobbes would say that right of revolution necessarily leads to war, war against all and chaos. And if, Locke says, no, human beings are rational and they will exercise the right of revolution in a, in a cautious manner, then maybe you don't need the right of revolution. Because if people were rational, a need for revolution would never arise. You see? It's kind of this catch-22, right? Either <laughs> genocides don't happen, or Locke is wrong. See? Or, or the third option is maybe Locke is Hobbes, right? And this is the option that I mentioned uh, uh, Leo Strauss opts for. So in conclusion, let me again, let me restate. I feel, I'm, I'm not trying to be unfair to Locke, but I think it's important for us to point out the issues and the problematic uh, uh, nature of Locke's philosophy. And I want to say that uh, the vast majority of political uh, philosophers that we're going to talk about later down the line in this course, I think are going to disagree with Locke and are going to be in basic agreement with Hobbes's assumptions. And Hobbes does seem to provide a certain kind of basis for, you know, human history in general. 
uh, explaining at the same time why slaves obeyed an ancient world and also the potential for progress, right? But uh, philosophers down the line are going to try to establish um, rights, protection, mm -hmm. protect, protection of um, citizen protection against the government, right? But put it on a firmer foundation. Do not start with these wishful thinking assumptions about you know, morality uh, and reason, right? But start from Hobbesian, unpalatable, mechanistic assumptions and try, within the broadly speaking Hobbesian framework, try to find a way, a mechanism, maybe a historical mechanism that will enable societies to progress in the space of human history. And again, this is another interesting point, right? How uh, uh, um, Locke, again, with his universalist notions of reason, is actually very blind to the ideas of history and of potential, potentially of historical progress. And again, this is something that we're going to see over and over and over again, again especially in, in Rousseau, in uh, um, Hegel, and in Marx, and in Mill. Right? This idea of how there's a possibility of progress. And I want to say that in, in, in many respects, this possibility of progress has to be based on the rejection of the idea of these natural and immutable rights, which are true for all times and in all places. Again, progress presupposes that people in the past made mistakes, right? And there's a possibility of doing things differently. There is no one obvious recipe that everybody knew, you know, since time immemorial. And this is uh, what we're going to turn to in the coming lectures.